from verse 16 to verse 18 please let us read the word of god together after the count of three one two three go confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you for this time in your presence. Thank you for the anointing that is present in this room. Father, we ask that you yourself will inscribe indelibly the infallibility of your word on the fleshly tables of your people's heart this morning. I ask that every heart be ready, prepared to receive the incorruptible seed of the word. And that by the reason of the word, our profiting will appear to all. That is my prayer this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You may please be seated. Glory to Jesus. This morning I want to move further on the subject that I started on Thursday. On effective prayer. So help me just turn to your neighbor and say to them, prayer must be effective. I, I want to start like I started on Thursday uh, by saying a few things to you. A few months back, I remember telling you about the experience I had sitting with some of my friends and how they came up with this issue that there were certain gentlemen who had studied the Bible and studied the Torah and studied the Quran. <clears throat> and came to the conclusion that of all the three holy books, that the Bible was the most inconsistent of the books, and that the Quran actually was the most consistent because it had a flow, and that based on their submission, um, droves were abandoning Christianity and turning to Islam, that people were abandoning the faith and turning to Islam. And they asked me um, what was my thought on the matter. They asked me what will my response be because it was becoming a problem. And they were wondering, you know, we, we need to have a response to this thing. What should the response be? And I remember sharing with you what I told them. I told them that the answer was so simple I did not understand how they could miss it. I told them that the answer is staring them in the face. Um, how could they not get it? Because as far as I was concerned, if my finite mind can totally figure out a God, then he cannot be God. And that the God I choose to serve is the one who declares that as high as the heavens are from the earth, so are his ways higher than our ways. That the God that I choose to serve has some mystic mysterion about him. Uh, that everything about him cannot just be 2 plus 2 is equal to 4 because if that were the case it will be a man uh, the God that I choose to serve is the God that has many sides the God that I choose to serve is the God uh, that the more you know of him concerning any particular aspect of his godliness the more you realize you don't know enough because every time you dig deeper, you realize that there's more depth to go. Every time you go higher, you realize that there's more height to climb. And that that is the God that I choose to serve. And in recent times, it's come to my notice. You know, a few friends have sent me clips and sent me stuff and said, Pastor Henry, looks like even in the nation Nigeria, um, these gentlemen that we thought were outside the country have a few followers in country and they are saying stuff and because people have not been well tutored a whole lot of people are turning away from the christian faith and turning to islam and it is interesting because this gentleman as well the one at the vanguard of what is going on in nigeria um, uses the bible uses the bible and by the time he is done he shows 
believers, as it were, the inconsistencies and the irregularities and um, makes them come to a logical conclusion. Um, why am I saying this to you? This is important because it is showing the underbelly of the Christian faith. It is showing us at the point where we are weakest. The truth is that a lot of people today who call themselves believers but who don't understand what they believe or who they believe. There are a whole lot of people in the body of Christ today. And that is why on Thursday I remember saying to the people, I love the prophetic. I love signs and wonders. It is an inherent, intrinsic, important part of what Christianity has to offer. But you see, when you go only after signs and wonders at the expense of good teaching, what happens is that once we peel away the layers of signs and wonders, there's nothing else on which your faith is standing. Which means that anybody who comes to you with something that looks like superior argument will win your agreement. Do you hear me in the house of God? Now, 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 th this, is, this, is, this is important because when I, when I consider some of the points that this gentleman is spewing out there, I, I, am, I, am, I am befuddled, I am amazed that any Christian, what is salt or has salt, will even find confusion in the matter. But it simply means that we have a generation of believers who understand signs, wonders, and miracles. And hear me, I am not saying they are not good. Who understand signs, miracles, and wonders, but do not understand the word. And because they do not understand the word, their understanding of God is lopsided. Uh, the first thing that you must understand is this. Every time you engage an argument, you engage in an argument concerning your faith on the basis of logic, you are going to lose. Why? There is nothing logical about the Christian experience. How do you explain with logic the issue of salvation? That someone said to you, believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, and that means you are born again. But you believe that by faith. And then someone comes to you and says, now let us really explain it by logic. The truth is, faith and logic are antithetical. They will not go together. They cannot cohabit. That is why we do not walk by sight, but by faith. The things about the God that I serve, many of them can be taught, but deeper concepts can only be caught. The truth, my friend, is a lot of people have not sat down under superior teaching or intelligent teaching to the point where catching the revelation becomes easy. So you have people who have teaching without revelation, and you have another bunch who have revelation without teaching. And, and when people come to church, for most people, what they come to write or what they come to do is look for revelation. Something they can use to bamboozle their friends when they sit at lunch in the office the next day. And they can break it down because it gives them a sense of superiority that they know something that their friends don't. But you must understand that Christianity transcends that. I, I remember this is a series of this gentleman's lectures. And as I sat there, with my headphones in my head, many times during the course of that lecture, I yanked up the headphone in anger at how Christians can sit there and act clueless on some of the points being raised by this gentleman. I remember this gentleman saying to a particular lady, saying, how can you say Jesus is God? And the woman said, yes, Jesus is God. And this gentleman said, how can you say Jesus is God? He said, that I will prove to you that Jesus is a man. How can you prove what is written? 
John chapter 1 verse 1 already told us who he was. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. You go down. That word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. Yes, he's a man. He needs no proving. But you see, believers do not study. So someone sits there and says, no, you say he's God, I will prove to you that he's a man. He slept. He said he was hungry. And then he would go and say, eh, does our God go hungry? Everybody say, no, take it be. Everybody will bow. Allah, who walk by. And, and the so-called Christian is sitting down there looking confused. He was totally God and totally man. That is how come we have an high priest who can be taught with the feelings of our infirmities. You don't, it is not a point to be proven. It is there. That is who he was. Are you still here? I remember this man saying things like, I want to show you the difference between Christianity, the two religions. That's what I heard. I want to show you the difference between the two religions. And the brother too was standing there like he had a point to prove. Yes, tell me. The difference between Christianity how can you sit and argue about religion you don't even know what you believe Christianity has never been will never be a religion once you approach it from the basis of religion you have lost the argument it is not a religion it is a relationship Are you still here? What is a relationship? A relationship is a connection. It's the dynamics of a connection between two people. That's simply what it is. Oh, let me show you another one that annoyed me. Can I show you? I will enter my text. I will, I will somehow get to my subject. But it's pinning me. Chai. Romans 6.16. Actually, it's Romans 6, 22 that the guy went to, but can you put it on for me? You know, he, he, said, he said, this gentleman looked at this brother and said to the brother, and said, I will prove to you now that there is no, in fact, that is even going far. He says, I will prove to you that Jesus is not the only begotten of the Father. Because in the Bible, my father, he now went to Romans 8. You know, this is so annoying. He went to Romans 8 and, and, and read, As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So how can you say Jesus is the only begotten son when all the people that are led by the Spirit are sons? And this brother is sitting down there. And I felt like putting my hand through the iPad and cracking him. I, I, are you still here? We only became sons because that is what he came to do. Are you still here? Let me show you this. This one is very interesting. Then he goes and says, Romans 6, if you... Ah, yes. That what do Christians call themselves? Say, no, we call ourselves children of God. Say, God doesn't have children. God only has slaves and servants. So I will prove it to you now from your Bible. And he came here. In fact, okay, let us read, but it's going to be a long read. I would have... Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are the ones, you are that one's slaves whom you obey? Whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. You know what? Go to 22. Go to 22. I want to show you something. Verse 22. But now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. They having been set from sin, you are now slaves of God. So the Bible was testifying about Islam. That's why everybody is a slave of God. God has no children. 
That is the argument. Go to verse 19. Go to 19. Because whenever you take a text out of context, you have no idea what he's saying. Paul here was he was giving an analogy. He said, in, I speak in human terms because of the, you know what? Give me message translation of this same text. This 619. This is why I use the language. He said, I'm using this freedom language because it's easy for you to picture. But believers do not read. Are you still here? So now someone just takes verse 23 and 22 out of context and tells you, I'm telling you now. You see, you're all servant of God. You're not. Why am I saying this? Because the subject I want to deal with deals with the fundamental. Today I want to talk to you about prayer. And because I know the generation of believers that is on the surface today. When you deal with fundamental stuff, they act like they know. So help me tap your neighbor and tell them for me, this is not the service to sleep. No, they didn't hear you. Tell them well. Make a for no cause quarrel. Tell them. Because it is in many of us acting like we know that has brought this confusion and, and, and all kinds of stuff that the basic tenets of the Christian faith we do not understand. Because when those things have been taught, they have a way of coming across as a lecture. And Christians don't like lectures. They don't like teachings. They like the spectacular. Man of God, move. Move now. Let the power flow. Move here now. Yes. And when you're dealing with regular stuff that you ought to know, we are not interested because we are so enamored with the spectacular. Not understanding that if you have the spectacular without knowledge, you're going to end in her error or heresy. You are still a babe who does not know how to rightly divide the word of truth. You know, I'm listening to that guy and he's mixing Old Testament principles and New Testament principles and yanking scriptures from everywhere and the people there cannot tell the difference. In what context what was said against the context in which something else was being said in the New and, and they're just there. And I am, I am appalled at the level of ignorance on display. Because every time pastors want to teach stuff like this, we act like, oh, we are prayer. You want to talk to me about prayer? And they pray. So tell your neighbor again so that it does not become an issue. Tell them. You cannot sleep in this service. Mm -hmm. Because it will become an issue. Are you still here? In the text that we read, James begins to talk to us about effectual fervent prayer. What is an effectual fervent prayer? He's talking about effective prayers. Prayers that are effective. What is an effective prayer? A prayer that gets results. Are you still here? If I ask people in this room, did you pray this morning? Everybody's going to say, yes, we prayed. But how many of your prayer have results? There was a reason I told them on Thursday that the, the disciples looked at the life of Jesus. And they said certain things to Jesus. They said to Jesus, Jesus, teach us to pray. Because John has taught his disciples how to pray. And I'm sure, or I imagine, that the prayers of John were quite popular back in the day. Um, but when they saw the end of John's prayer, that John and the prayer that he was praying ended up being beheaded. They went to Jesus and said, Jesus, teach us how to pray. That John's prayer, where did it end? Ibelah say, get come out. Teach us how to pray. Why do you think they went to him to ask him to teach them how to pray? Because they have seen the result of his prayers. Effective prayer 
is prayer that has result. Are you still here, my friends? And on Thursday, I began to tell us the things that we need to do for our prayers to have result. Mm -hmm. How many of you were here on Thursday? The rest of you that were not here, what were you doing? It's the reason why you don't know the difference between religion and relationship. Because you don't show up on Thursday. That stuff is, is elementary for you. You know, it's Sunday school material. We went to Sunday school. So, if your prayer is going to be effective, there are a few things you must know. Number one, you must decide what you want. Are you still here? You must decide what you want. In fact, let me stop. Those of you that were here on Thursday, please don't say anything. When we pray, who do we pray to? I'm listening. Huh? Jesus, God. After all, Jesus is God. When we pray, who do we pray to? Who is sure? All this whispering under. <laughs> God, I know sure that not God. Though, maybe. It's Jesus. Let's not come disgrace himself. Open, open. Do you know that the number one reason why Christians' prayers are not answered is because many of us pray to Jesus. When you pray, you pray to the Father. Can I have John 16? I think. I hope it's John 16. 16.23, I think. Quickly, 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 quickly. Now, lift up your head and look at the screen. In that day, you will ask me nothing. Which day was he talking about? Help me. What day? What day was that day? Thank you very much. In the day after I have died, resurrected, and I'm seated in heaven, which is the dispensation of grace in which we now operate, in this day, you will ask me nothing. Jesus said, don't ask me. Don't ask me. In that day, you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I said to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name. So you don't ask him. How many times have you prayed, Jesus, help me? Oh, oh come on, help me here. It sounds religiously correct, but does not guarantee an answer. Are you still here? So what do you do with Jesus? Let me tell you. Whenever you talk to Jesus, what you get is the lifting of your body. Your spirit feels lifted because you have been able to pour out your heart. You know why? He's the one who can be touched with the feelings of our infirmity. So when you go and you're going, Father, please. Or you go, Jesus, please. No, this thing is really paining me. Jesus understands. But you see, Jesus, this thing is really paining me. It does not take the pain away because you have not asked for the pain to be taken away. And if you're asking him, you're asking the wrong person. Are you still here? So we pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. I know there are some of you here who still pray for Christ's sake. Let me help you. For Christ's sake does not work because your grammar is incorrect. When you are in pain 
and you say, um, Father, heal me for Christ's sake. What you are saying grammatically is, Christ is not the one that is in pain. Are you still hearing me? You are the one that is in pain. So when you say for Christ's sake, it's like saying, heal Jesus now for his sake. You know, he's in pain. Are you still here? I wish I had the time to jump into the if it is thy will prayer. How many of you have prayed, Father, if it is your will, let this business prosper. Let me tell you, every time you put if it is thy will, you've already introduced doubt into your prayer. Mark eleven twenty three. 23. Whatsoever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive and ye shall have it. Period. For assuredly I said to you, whosoever says to this man will be removed and be cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatsoever he says. Go to 24, let me see. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Whatsoever you desire. Now, this is where we have the problem. You are not sure whether your desire is in the will of God. <laughs> because even you, you suspect your desire. As you saw someone's husband walking and they are looking like such a perfect couple. Say, Father. Father, if it be thy will. In fact, let your will be done concerning this man and me. That is why I told them on Thursday, the best way to pray is to know and decide what you want and just ask. But our problem or conflict of what is our desire, whether it is in the will of God, is a function of us not knowing the word. The Bible says to us, I think it's First John, this is the confidence that we have in him. That when we ask anything according to his will, we know that he hears. Oh, this is what is so good. So, so, so what happens? If we ask according to his will, we know that he hears. It means once we ask what is not in his will, he doesn't hear. He doesn't hear at all. It's not, he does not hear. Tap your neighbor and tell them you came to class. See, I can preach to you and tell you that when you walk out of the doors, you will see cars and you will get cars you did not buy. You will live in houses that you did not build and that you will marry wives without paying bride price. But, and everybody here will be sweet. Man of God, talk to me. <laughs> but that does not build you. So, how do I know the will of God? He's already told us his will in his word. So whatever the word has guaranteed that you can have, it is already in his will. So don't go and say, Father, I, um, if it is your will, let me be promoted. That is total nonsense. He says promotion does not come from the east or from the west. It comes from where? It comes from above. In, he said you will be head only and not the tail. In other words, promotion is his will. So when you go to the father, you go, Father, thank you because the promotion is mine. That is prayer. Yeah. 
Because a lot of this, let me, let me tell you the mistake we make. How many of you love sports? You see, prayer is like a sport, and every sport has rules. How many of you know that if you love football, and I know that many soccer people here, will, you really love soccer, you don't lift your hand, yeah, yes. And you understand the rules of soccer. What do you think is going to happen if you try to apply the rules of soccer to wrestling? Both of them are sports. But the rules are different. There are rules that govern prayer. Even though, you see, talking to Jesus is a kind of prayer. But it is not the prayer that, that gives you what you are asking. It is the prayer that allows you to empty your heart because he's your advocate. He can be touched with the feelings of your infirmity. So when you empty your heart, Jesus looks at the Holy Spirit and says, Holy Spirit, go to work. So the Holy Spirit begins to rub your back. How many of you have been in trouble? And after you went to the place of prayer and you cried, and you said, Father, he's spreading you, the way they're doing me, I don't like it. Oh. Hey, and you cry, and you cry, and you cry. When you get up, you feel better. Does it mean what you cried for you got? No. But there is some lifting in your heart because you have been able to empty your heart. You see, that feeling of it's better that you feel it's the Holy Spirit. Sorry, sorry, I'm here. It will be okay. You, you, you. Eh? But you see, even though it's giving you comfort, it does not mean the answer is coming because you have to activate what brings the answer. He that asketh, receive it. Matthew 7, 7. Ask and you will receive. Seek, you will find. Knock and the doors will be open to you. The problem with the body of believers today is we are content with the rubbing of the back of the Holy Spirit. So when we don't get it, we will take the rubbing of the back. That is okay. I feel better. It's all right. It's all right. If they don't give me the promotion, it's okay. But I feel better. I know it will be okay. Someday, somehow, somewhere. And that is why it looks like our pain is extended. Because you keep going, pouring your heart, feeling better, but nothing really changes. And so you can be there for 14 years. And you're wondering, then one day, you come to God and throw a tantrum. Now so we're going to go. No, 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 no. And then you hear the voice of the Holy Spirit telling you it's going to be okay. How many of you have been there? They say, you know, you are hearing, it is well. Then you are answering. You are hearing it is well in your spirit, but your answer is, it is not well. It's not. Oh, come on, talk to me. Talk to me. Oh, dear. Because believers just don't know how prayer is supposed to work. It is not difficult. Just follow the rules. So I tell people, the best way to pray and be sure you're praying is will is first and foremost get the word. Oh, okay. Let me deal with another thing. I'm just. Are you getting something this morning? All right. Let me. Let me. <laughs> you know. Uh, watch uh, and, and people. People tell me, but Pastor, I know the word. Have you met people who can quote Bible frontwards and backwards, but their life, lives are stagnant? I've met a few in my time. People who really, they've memorized, uh, memorized. <laughs> no, I want to say yards again. Yards and yards of scripture. And when they meet you, in two, three minutes, you are dumbfounded at what they are throwing at you. They are using scripture to connect scripture. But you look at their life and it, don't, it looks like that word does not work. Now, this is a true test. Now, for someone who knows plenty Bible, you will think that if trouble hits them, it is what is inside that will come out. But in most cases, what I have realized is this. Once trouble comes, they are the first to complain. Father, is it fair? Is it fair? Is it fair? Is, it, is, this, is, this, is this what you promised in your word? 
Is this, I wish I can deal with that stuff. You see, many of the things you call prayer is actually complaining. Oftentimes, you have not asked for anything, even when you go to the Father. People go to the Father and go, Father, Father, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, you are here, you are in heaven, you are seeing me, you are seeing me and seeing my condition and I am your child. I pray every day. I pay my tithe. I go to church. And of all the people in this world that they are going to dupe of their money, it is me. Father. Father. Deal with them. Father. You see, when you call him Father, you have caught his attention. But you have not asked for anything. So people said, I've spent three hours in prayer, but actually they have spent three hours complaining and grumbling. So they say, Father, can you imagine how they're talking about me in our church? Just because I asked them to remove their, their, their nonsense bag from on top of the chair so that somebody else can sit down. Is it okay, Father, even in the house of God, that people will keep chair, will keep bag, and people will be standing? What have I done wrong, my father? What have I done wrong? Is it wrong to do the right thing even in the house of God, Father? No, Father, tell me if I've done wrong. Now, you will do that for one hour and walk away from there thinking that you have prayed. But the truth is that you have not prayed. You've spent one hour complaining and grumbling. You have asked for nothing. Whatever, whatsoever you ask in my name. The problem is we complain, we grumble, we never ask. Are you still here? Okay. Where was I that took me to this? Oh, yes, what? So, you find these people who have a lot of, they know a lot of Bible. They've memorized a lot of scripture. But when you push them, well, life pushes them. Life throws, and life throws everybody punches. Whether you know what or you don't know what, life is going to throw you a few punches. You know, I, I keep saying there are some you can dodge, you can duck, but once in a while, life catches with a very horrible uppercut. You know, you know that one you didn't see coming. You are, you, are, you are thinking of this, you are focused on the ministry. Father, this ministry, we are moving forward. We are moving forward. Hallelujah. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. I need to grow this one. I need to grow. This. And then life catches you, it blindsides you. Pooh. And you are flat on your back. And usually when life throws punches like that, what comes out is what really tells us whether the scripture you mouth is in your head or in your heart. There are people that will respond in the flesh because all they know is the scripture in their head. But there are people that will respond from the heart. You know why? It is always out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. So it is your response in the day of trouble. It's not a function of Bible you know in your head. It is a function of Bible you know in your heart. Now this is the challenge that the 21st century believer has. How do I take the stuff in my head to my heart? You must be deliberate about it. The answer is so simple, but I'm shocked a lot of people don't know. The way to take the scripture in your head to your heart is via a channel called meditation. So reading the Bible and not meditating is not as beneficial as if you meditate on the word. What does it mean to meditate on You focus a set of thoughts on it. You just focus on it. You just focus on it. Oh, okay, let me bring it. It's like eating very good suya. Let me help you. Are there good suya eaters here? People who, who do suya, huh? Okay. If you're, if you're watching from outside the country, um, suya is... Kebab. All right, kebab, yeah. Seasoned, marinated beef or lamb, chicken, kebab. 
in Nigeria, we call it suya. <laughs> All right. Now, it's like, like there's one, one crazy guy now somewhere in the corner of Jerry. That guy is just messing things up in the market. That guy is a bad somebody. I don't know how, what it does to that suya. It's uh, very biblical. So I saw the man of God parked there. I said, man of God. I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, let, 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 me, let me show you how, how, how. <laughs> Why are you revealing the secret? What's wrong with you? All right. How, how do you take word from your head to your heart? I'm telling you that meditation at times is like, is like, you see, when you put suya in your mouth, the first thing that hits your taste buds is whatever they poured on it. That's the outer shell. That is the word in your head. As you continue to chew and masticate, there is a second layer of flavor that hits you that makes the suya unforgettable. That is the work done before it was roasted in how it was... Ah, jeez. <laughs> Meditation is that second flavor where now it is what was put inside it before they, they, they roasted and put on the fire. You know, after you know, the process is it's prepared in a particular way. And then when you go there, they now put it and then they put on top. Now, reading of the word is the on top. The masticating and the chewing over and over again releases what was the inside content that tottery is. Is, is the word for tottery? All right. Titillates, thank you. <laughs> tottery and titillate are. Uh. When that hits you, you will realize that that is what makes you come back. The way it was produced. That is, the best. That is why the word, the word for meditate is the chewing of the cord. Because it is only when you begin to chew it and mutter and, and focus on it and ponder that that second flavor begins to come out of the word then it's making its way into your heart that when trouble comes and you look at your account and it is in the red what comes out of you is not the pepper that hits your taste bud the first time you put it in your mouth it is that second flavor that makes you say is able to make all grace abound towards me that I have been sufficiency in all things will abound unto every good. See, there is a place that that is coming from that, that, that settles you so you can have peace even though your account is in the red because you understand that that word cannot fail. It must produce. Are you still here? We are still on point one. Okay. I also told them on Thursday. Ooh. Okay, let me just. Now, the number two thing is you must believe that you receive. All right? Number three. So that I add something to it. If your prayer is going to work, you must keep what you are asking in the arena of positive thinking. You must be positive in your thinking. You must never allow or permit any mental picture of failure in your mind. For instance, this is what happens to many of us. I have asked for money. Father, 
according to your word. You supply all my needs according to your riches in glory. I declare that my needs are met. Now unto you that is able to do exceedingly abundantly. Exceed my expectation concerning what I am asking you for. Thank you because you are true to your word and you leave it. Then you leave the place where you have asked in faith. And whilst you ask, you believe that you have received. You are just waiting. Because I, I told them on Thursday the difference between um, the fact that you have it, that you must come on Thursday. Right? The difference between ownership and possession. Basically, that's what I was. The fact that someone has paid for it, it is yours, but it is not yet in your house. All right. So. Then you take all of that, and then you go and visit Brother Blessing. And then you and Brother Blessing, you are talking. And as it is with most Nigerians, the issue of money and the economy is going to come up. My brother, now, whoa! Things just hard. You have just finished praying. And when you prayed, you believe that you have had what you asked for. You are just waiting for the physical manifestation. Then you are in an environment that has brother blessing and brother blessing is going on and on things are so hard money is so hard to come by poverty no go die well what kind of thing is that as i broke like this eh? broken bottle broke past me and then he's talking and then you are there and you are hearing let me tell you what happens when we stay in those kind of conversations he says and your mind paints pictures so then your mind begins to now take on the image of what he is saying. So you are there and he's complaining. Things are hard. Before you know it, what usually happens? You will join the conversation. My brother, eh? Now God, go help us. So if for me, I had to pray this morning, you know, so that money will come the way we will broke, eh? The minute you go there, you have started puncturing you know why? Stand up. Let's do what we did on Thursday so that they can get this. Um, Augusta, stand up. Stand up. I want to close here. This is God. This is Brother Blessing. All right? Brother Blessing has been playing. Father, I need a car. A nice one. I am specific with my need. Father, I need a car, not just a car. I need an E300 2018. Exterior color black, interior color. <laughs> he says it's cream. Okay. And, and he has a mental picture of it, and he's, he's praying about it. And he has believed that he has it. God moves through Pastor Larry and says, look at blessing. And I'm in church and I just look at blessing. And the Holy Spirit tells me, bless blessing with a car. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> and the Holy Spirit impresses in my heart to give him an E400. Same car he has been asking for. So I take blessing. I said, bless it, follow me somewhere. I need to show you something. And then we go. Sorry, you are, you are, you are no longer God. You are the Cadilla. <laughs> I am God. <laughs> so, so I take blessing to the car dealer. And I pay the car dealer for the car. The car dealer issues a receipt in blessing's name. Blessing goes home in the same 2K2K 2K 2K broke down car that brought him here. But does he have an E400? Yes. Does he have an E400? Yes. Good. So, he has ownership because he has receipt. But is he driving an E400? Why? Because he does not yet have possession. Now, if blessing is smart, 
Blessing is calm, he is cool, expecting the delivery of his he 400. That is all he needs to do. So every time he goes to God in prayer, Father, thank you for the car. Thank you. Woo, I see myself rocking that car. I see myself driving the streets of Port Harcourt. And that is his mental picture. Now, if blessing makes the mistake of going to Pastor Walter and they are gisting, and Pastor Walter starts casting aspersion on my ability to give, say, ah, who promised you? <laughs> Pastor Larry, that I give you. <laughs> now he got to jump like this. I saw him promise in Kichu, he never give up. I saw him promise Esther, <laughs> or let's go give her an Esther. I say, once all of that begins to happen, and then he begins to think, ah, this Pastor Larry really make me look how well. Especially we won't give person E400, what in the drive? You see, the minute he begins to do that, cast your mind back to Daniel. First day, Daniel had the receipt of the prayer. God had already answered. He believed he had it. But the prince of Pasha stood in the way for 21 days. Watch this. So, for Daniel, the time between ownership and possession was 21 days. From first day, he had ownership. But he did not have possession until 21 days later. For some of you, from day one, you had ownership. But your possession, depending on the dynamics of what's happening in between, may be one year after. But you see, in that one year, you cannot allow your faith to waver in the ability of him who promised you. You know why? Because if Daniel had stopped praying on the 11th day, Whilst the angel was on his way, the pastor said, you don't go past, you don't go past, you don't go past. That's why I tell people, you know all of you that pray for angels, I need my angel to be a chemical engineer, a really serious angel. You see, when you see ISF, you need to bring something for me. You don't go start for a way now. For what? <laughs> you know, all of you have all these gentle angels that flap their wings. My own angel is from Wakanda. Now, nail, nail, nail. You know, they, you know they play. <laughs> all right. I just... <laughs> When he flaps his wing like this, now iron dead here. So, so the priest of Pasha, we was the, you know, what was the difference? No, really, really. Who was the difference? Gabriel was bringing, or oh, was it Gabriel? Was bringing the, uh, then they're wasting time, did they? They speak English. No, please, I need to go deliver this message. The Lord Jesus, the Lord God Almighty has set me on this errand. I need to go deliver this to Daniel. Uh, indeed, they speak English. Michael, just show. Hey! See, I was just discussing with him. No, no, pass. <laughs> but you see, <laughs> but you see, what usually happens is once his faith begins to waver because he went to an arena where doubt is clouding what he believed he had received. Michael quote and unquote, is not empowered to come and ensure that 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 he already has the receipt for gets to him. So to him, it begins to look like God did not answer. Meanwhile, it was because after he believed, he went into an arena where people were speaking doubt and it affected his heart. And that did not empower and ensure that 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 has been released to him eventually got to him. Did you get something this morning? Stand to your feet. Time is done. Thank you.